Okay. Welcome to this Royal Irish Academy webinar on COVID-19 and the New Year's challenges, vaccines, variants, and critical care. We have a distinguished panel today to discuss crucial questions as we experience a new phase in the ongoing crisis posed by the pandemic. With alarming infection rates and hospitalization figures and indeed mortality in Ireland, Europe, and so many other parts of the world. My name is Daniel Carey and I'm a Vice President of the Royal Irish Academy and Director of the Moore Institute at the National University of Ireland, Galway. This is the sixth session that we've had in our RIA series called Perspectives and Pathways in a Time of Crisis. We have convened discussions on the science of COVID-19, economic questions, issues of social justice, the resilience of the higher education system and lessons from previous pandemics. The last one was a session that Mike Ryan kindly participated in back in October. Recordings of these events are available on the Academy's webpage. I want to thank Jennifer Keneally and the RIA for her help as ever. She's running the technical side of things behind the scenes. More than 620 people have signed up for today's session. Thank you very much for joining us. We invite you to participate with questions via the chat function on Zoom. Our chair today is Professor Patricia Carney. Patricia is Professor of Epidemiology in the School of Public Health in University College Cork. She serves on the board of the Irish Research Council. She's also a member of the Independent Scientific Advisory Group in Ireland, ISAG. Patricia is an experienced epidemiologist and clinical trialist with research that focuses largely on chronic disease prevention and management. She graduated from UCC with a medical degree and subsequently trained as an academic and physician in Ireland, the US and the UK. Over to you, Patricia. Thanks, Dan, and thanks for um, this opportunity. I'm looking forward to a really interesting conversation with our panelists this afternoon. And as Dan mentioned, we were very fortunate to be joined by a range of experts. And um, so from uh, uh, Professor Alistair Nicol, who's an intensive care specialist in St. Vincent's Hospital um, and also Professor of Critical Care Medicine in UCD. And um, Alistair, as well as being a very busy uh, clinician and um, he's just done 10 or 14 days in a row um, on clinical service. He's also an academic um, clinical trialist with an interest uh, in pandemic preparedness, so very um, relevant to today's discussions and the conduct of clinical trials in the critically ill. Um, he also chairs the Irish Critical Care Clinical Trials Group and is director of the HRB Irish um, Critical Care Clinical Trials Network. Um, and he also has strong international links um, and, and is professor in the Australian and New Zealand Intensive Care Research Centre at Monash University School of Public Health in Melbourne. Um, we're also joined today by Dr. Anne Moore. Um, Anne is a senior lecturer in biochemistry and cell biology in UCC, and her in, uh, research focuses on vaccine development and um, access and acceptability. Um, she completed her PhD in HIV vaccine immunology and subsequently conducted postdoctoral uh, work in the Worcester Institute in Philadelphia and was also a senior immunologist in Professor Adrian Hill's group um, in the University of Oxford. And her current research focuses on the, on the development and translation of innovative vaccines to address equitable access and acceptability needs and um, topics that I think we may well uh, touch on today. And of note, um, the, our next uh, two panelists that I'm going to introduce to you um, Dr. Moore mentioned that their work um, on many vaccines, in particular Ebola and polio, has really shaped um, Anne's uh, portfolio of research in UC UCC on making needle-free, easy to administer vaccine systems and to answer the critically important question of how you rapidly and e easily immunize millions of people when there is an epidemic or pandemic outbreak. Um, so then our other two speakers uh, today are from the uh, World Health Organization, um, Dr. Mike Ryan, I think, probably no, needs no introduction, um, certainly to, to Irish uh, people who are tuning in today or people based in Ireland. Um, uh, he's a medical graduate of NUI Galway and has an MPH from UCD and has been working in the WHO for, uh, for nearly 25 years. And he's currently executive director of the WHO's Health Emergencies Programme. Um, he's had many roles in the WHO, um, including coordinating the response to the SARS outbreak and also a senior advisor on polio eradication for the Global Polio Eradication Initiative. We're also fortunate to be joined today by Dr. Anna Maria Hineo Restrepo, 
um, who had, uh, has a medical degree from the University of El Rosario in uh, Colombia and a master's in communicable disease epidemiology from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and uh, with the WHO and has worked on strategies to eradicate polio, uh, measles, maternal and neonatal tetanus in, in, in Southeast Asia, Eastern Africa, Nicaragua, El Salvador and Colombia. And she was central to the 2014 Ebola vaccine trials, um, which I understand was very contentious at the time, um, but you know, it was a successful project and there may well be learnings from that that are relevant for our discussions today. So welcome to you all. Um, so I might kick off, if I may, um, with a question uh, uh, to you, Mike, in terms of, um, you know, we're currently living in uh, an increasingly complex global society and we're now facing into year two of, of, of dealing with this pandemic. And I was just wondering, from your perspective, what the outlook now is for the, the global situation. Patricia, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank Great. you. Uh, it's lovely to join you and uh, nice to be talking to home, at least virtually. Um, uh, and thanks for inviting myself and uh, Anna Maria. Anna Maria is also Irish. She's, uh, she's married to an Irish man. Uh, and she's, uh, Irish. she's been enculturated uh, uh, as an Irish Colombian, eh? uh, which is a wonderful mix. Uh, the, uh, certainly in terms of the... Uh, the current, I mean, the global situation right now, and, you know, we are facing into a, some headwinds. Um, as, as you know, um, epidemics change as they evolve, um, and they can take turns for the good and turns, turns, turns for the bad. Um, right now, we've got that sort of perfect storm, that sort of we've got the cold weather in the north driving everyone indoors. We've got a lot of social mixing because of holidays and people and families wanting to see each other after so long apart and a lot of movement because of those holidays. Um, and that in itself will be tough enough um, and has driven quite a deal of transmission across Europe, uh, including in Ireland. Uh, and in that sense, we're already rowing in a difficult sea, but uh, in, in a sense, the, the emergence of uh, variants is also now adding to the complexity of the task. Uh, I have likened that to, you know, it doesn't change the rules of the game. It's not changed the way in which a virus transmits. It's not at this point, from what we understand, associated with changes in clinical severity, not associated with, uh, so far as we can determine, changes in the capacity of our diagnostics or our vaccines. But that still remains to be fully tested and explored. Manna Maria may outline that to you later. But it is rowing against the tide that's coming in. And if you're uh, uh, not to, 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 to be too uh, flippant about this, but uh, it reminds me of uh, the joke about asking for directions, uh, tourists asking for directions in Kerry, and the person says, well, if I was going there, I wouldn't start from here. And, and in a sense, if you're starting in to dealing with the emergence of a variant, at starting from a very high level of transmission in any case, then you really are in a in a difficult situation. And I think some countries are facing that right now, the UK, Ireland and others. And it really does mean we have to double down. The fact is the same measures. And again, I think in Ireland over the last uh, number of days, we've seen a, a leveling off and, and, and a stabilization and a drop off, I think in some cases in the new incident cases. Um, but if we look at this at a region or a global level, <clears throat> the um, we see a different pattern. Uh, we saw a flattening out over the holiday period, and we think that's a reporting artifact. Uh, and now we've seen the disease pick up again, and we've had nearly three quarters of a million cases in the last week. We've had over 85,000 deaths. Um, and we see an increasing pattern <clears throat> in the Americas, in Europe, um, uh, and a, uh, in Africa, uh, in the Western Pacific, and a still a decreasing pattern in Southeast Asia uh, and, and, and in the Eastern Mediterranean. But within, even within those general decreases, there are countries with increasing rates. So a very mixed pattern. But the 51% of all the cases are still in the Americas, and the European area you know, still, even though there's been a, a stabilization in numbers, it's still making up over 30% of global cases and deaths. So it's a, it's a, we're very in a very intense phase of the pandemic. We've got sustained community transmission going on in multiple countries. We've got a, a breakdown uh, in a sense, and it's an understandable one <clears throat> uh, in, in behavior 
where you know societal mixing, let's face it, <clears throat> has just increased in many settings. People are tired. Uh, uh, people, uh, it's been a long, long time. Uh, it's hard to sustain these measures, and people have lost the association. And let me also say, we've become a bit numbed to the numbers. Sometimes I, you know, we say we're about to, we're over ninety million cases. We're going to hit two million deaths in the next few days. It's two million deaths. I mean, to, to even say those words from a single disease that we didn't know existed a year ago is uh, is an incredible thing. But those words and those numbers <clears throat> may have been a shroud that could be waved in front of people a year ago, but they're not anymore. People have lost that sense of what they can do to stop this disease. Um, and I think we're struggling as a, as a science community and as a public health community to continue to convince people to really take this seriously and understand that the risk <clears throat> posed to them but also the risk of them infecting others and not just the one generation next, but the generation after that and the generation after that. And who knows who will die two, three or four generations down from your infection. And we really have not internalized the idea that this disease should stop with me. Uh, and and mm -hmm. are sustained that idea. So um, when I look around the world right now, I can see hope and some of the patterns. Some countries continue and have sustained suppression of the virus over a very long period of time. Ireland did exceptionally well on two occasions. And I mean, really did in, the, in, in March and April, in, 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 the, in, the, in the autumn, the Irish people, the Irish government, Irish science, Irish, everything came together and you nailed it. Uh, unfortunately, Ireland has just seen this really rapid rise. Uh, my own view is that can be turned around, but it's going to take concerted effort of government, of people, of, of everyone in the public health community to make that happen. So I'm not without hope, but I, I must say I'm, I'm concerned that we're not sustaining the things we need to do at any level. And we're doing that in the face of the emergence of variants that may change the game. Uh, and if, they, if those variants begin to change the rules of this game, then we could be in serious trouble. Thanks, uh, Mike. I share your concerns. And I suppose one of the things I wanted to ask you about was the kind of balance of personal and political responsibility. And certainly in Ireland, I feel there's been a lot of emphasis on how we behave. And of course, that's you know a huge part of the response. But um, I do wonder whether, particularly in Europe, and you know, when we compare Europe to other regions, whether there is a need for, for different strategic approach and greater political leadership to, to try and um, more aggressively suppress the virus. Yeah, no, no question, because we're asking people to do extraordinary things. And when you ask people to do extraordinary things, and we, you hear governments, politicians, we say it all the time, we're taking extraordinary measures. This requires extraordinary commitment. And we're asking people to, to you know, you wouldn't ask someone to climb Mount Everest without training or resources, and you wouldn't ask someone to run in the Olympics without the training and investment to be able to do that. And we do expect an awful lot of our people. Um, and when we ask people to quarantine themselves if they're a contact, that's a huge ask. If they can't shop or they can't get their kids taken care of or if they're a case to self-isolate. If you're a single parent, how do you self-isolate from your kids? You know, if you're, a, if you're a, 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 an older person who has carers who need to come into the home, how do you self-isolate? It requires... And we've, we have, I think, collectively, and this is not an Irish-specific thing, we've spent a tremendous amount of money mitigating the economic impacts of this at the macro level. But at the micro level, for those individuals who have to sacrifice, particularly those high cases who have to isolate, uh, again, if you have to go into isolation or you have to go into a, a quarantine facility, who's taking care of the rest of your life? Where are the social supports for that? Uh, that's, that's a problem. And, and I do agree with you. I absolutely agree with you. I don't think governments have got to the got to the break of the ball on that at all. Uh, it's very easy. We have big fiscal stimulus and we talk in billions and trillions and we're injecting capital and we're injecting funds into the system to shore up the system. Well, we might be shoring up the stock market, but we're not shoring up individuals in their lives. Uh, and I think that's maybe where we've missed a trick in those social supports, those economic supports that are needed to support people who are taking extraordinary measures to protect themselves and others. So I do think there's a trick there. But at the same time, uh, and also we've, we've not done a great job at times of communicating with people and being real and honest. And, you know, in some countries, they're 
underplaying the pandemic. Maybe in others they're overplaying it. But you know, if 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 on the one day we're saying it's not a problem, it's going to go away, and then the next day we're screaming at people to to wear masks and self isolate. There's a lot of mixed messaging. I don't think that's the case in Ireland, frankly. But I think in a lot of countries, there's been a lot of mixed messaging on that. It's either a problem or it isn't. Um, and uh, we've not been consistent collectively in giving people consistent messaging. There's also been a lot of misinformation, conspiracy theories, uh, pandemic denial denial, and all of that going on as well. And that plays into people's lives. And I think we we, we need to get better at, at, at occupying the space in communications in communities. I don't think we've mobilized civil society, non-governmental organizations and supported them in the way we could have. I think it's, you know, you've seen a lot of siloed government activity, big siloed systems. We're going to introduce a new system for track and trace, a new system for that. And it's a very systems thinking and it's very verticalized. But when you get down to the community level, there's no real community organization around this in any country, in, in some. If you go to places in Thailand and other places in, in, in Southeast Asia, there are local community yes. committees. They're running the response. Yeah. They're taking care of the contact tracing and the social support. They're doing it with the support of government. The Western model is vertical. In some countries, we have a separate testing system to a public health contact tra- follow-up system to a public health monitoring system. And, 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 and it's verticalized from the local level right to the national level. There's a lot of disconnects in the system. So we may have to think, I mean, Ireland has some amazing amazing uh, uh, societal organizations. Well, I often, I, I've said it before, I've said it to, to, to political leaders now, the likes of the, the, the Gaelic and the, the GAA, you know, the, you have communities, organizations that are embedded inside our communities with the Red Cross movement. We have, we have all kinds of volunteer organizations. And I'm not so sure that governments anywhere have fully engaged civil society, the non-government sector, in helping uh, to give communities the power over their own response. I mean, in in places in Southeast Asia, they appoint community wardens from the community. Each building has a warden, a person from the community Mm -hmm. who's assigned and is involved in the discussions on contact tracing and quarantine, and who's going to take care of Mary's child because she has to go into quarantine and find someone to take care of. You know, it's much more driven at community level, and that makes it more sustainable because then you put the resources in at community level and then people see that and then they can sustain the behavior. So I'm sorry, I'm getting a bit uh, uh, impassioned about this because you, you triggered me in saying it because I, I'm always driving it to say people, it's our responsibility to do the right thing. Um, but it's also the responsibility of, um, it's also the responsibility of government uh, to to also provide that level of support. But equally, uh, and, I, and I have to say this too, there's an awful lot of government bashing going on in many countries. You know, I mean, at the end of the day, there are people serving in government and public services and, and, and organizations that are doing their level best. They're, they're, they're working 20 hours a day too, right? Um, and they don't deserve to have constant criticism shoveled at them, right? They, we, they need to be, and we need to be held to account for decisions but you cannot operate in an emergency if every time you lift your head, you get it taken off by every vested interest, every, you know, everyone that wants to write the negative article. We have to find a more positive way to manage this. It can't be uh, action and recrimination and then action and recrimination because now you, you train the political system to only act in its own interest, only act in its own defense and not necessarily in the full interest of a community. Uh, people will only act truly uh, in that way when it's not a fear of reprisal or it's not a fear of, of retribution, but it is very hard for many people to operate in emergencies particularly. Uh, and I think that's why a lot of uh, politicians in the past hate this kind of situation because you are either the hero or the zero. You know, you're not in the middle. None of us are heroes in the, in the public service as such. We're all shiny ass bureaucrats, for God's sake. But we're not zeros either. And this idea that people are either going to be lauded and put on pedestals or chided uh, and put on the naughty step, it, it's not, that doesn't work. We need to find a more functional way for government, 
for media and for society to engage. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I think uh, we do need to move towards a kind of a more whole of society approach to this. And um, one of the things you mentioned was um, the people in the public service. And I suppose one of our panelists is um, at the uh, coal face on this in terms of working in the intensive care unit. So maybe it would be helpful, um, Alistair, if you want to come in here now and speak to, just to give us a little bit of a sense. Um, Mike mentioned there the importance of communicating the reality on the ground. And I think we have had very open communication in Ireland in terms of the, the numbers, uh, but maybe you can give us a sense of what's actually happening um, uh, behind those numbers. And um, that would be great. Yeah, no, no, sure. So maybe I'll deal with that in a few ways. So I, I suppose in, in Ireland, um, I mean, almost nightly, the, the numbers of new cases, hospitalised and ICU is being reported. And to pick up on maybe the point Mike raised, we have become numb. And especially over the Christmas period when there was more mixing and the numbers rose and rose and of new of new uh, new cases reported every day. And I, I think a lot of people were still numb. And unfortunately now, I think we're actually starting to see the reality of it. The hospitalizations is increasing at uh, frightening levels. And I work in the ICU and we're seeing uh, large numbers of admissions every day. And if up until now, I mean, with the new variant aside, this disease has been pretty predictable. And if you look at the modeling and the cases that are due to, to come into ICUs in the next week or two in Ireland, it's, it, it's, it's actually very sobering. And um, I think I, I, um, I, I think the public is, n is actually now starting to grasp that. And unfortunately, it's taken a while. And I think we're going to probably learn qu quite, quite a tough lesson. I, I know in the hospitals, um, people, are, people are very worried about this. Now, I, I, but there's, a, there's a, maybe a few good things to say about this is um, people are working very hard. So th th there was a, 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 a Brendan Brian joke was, you know, I mean, there was no situation so bad that the presence of a police officer couldn't make it worse. And in a sense that sometimes people felt about the, you know, the health service in that way, but it is actually working with a, um, a, a unity of purpose. If you know what I mean, that bureaucracy, it's actually quite amazing. Bureaucracy has vanished and things are all moving in, this, in the same direction to a common goal to try and meet this challenge. And st st staff are tired, staff have worked hard, um, but they are, it, it's amazing what is occurring on the ground to facilitate um, what's predicted to be, um, you know, double our current ICU capacity being admitted to hospitals in the next number of weeks. And, um, and, and, and maybe just one other brief point and then I'll stop is, um, there has been, when we're talking about communica communication and solidarity, I think the science community has actually worked quite well. And in, in particular, I'm interested in uh, clinical trials and collaborative clinical trials. And we had been planning for pandemics for a while, but w when it came, it was still a huge shock. And it was different than we had imagined. And we had put, we had, we and the, the various colleagues in the UK, Australia, and other places we work had put plans in place. But actually, some of them have started to come off, and we're actually discovering new treatments for people uh, who are critically ill with COVID in the ICU. So, you know, steroids that many people have heard about. There's other drugs are called IL-6 receptor antagonists, tocilizumab, that a paper was uh, put out last week. And we're actually in Ireland, Irish patients, Irish hospitals, Irish researchers are contributing to research that is actually finding new treatments in an unprecedented short period of time in the face of this pandemic. So while it is frightening and while, um, as Mike was saying, the number of cases and the deaths is actually staggering, there are some bright points to this. And there are some really good examples of the public service working together for the community and also scientists uh, nationally and internationally collaborating together for new treatments. Great, thanks Alistair. And I think you're right, it is really important that we also emphasize the positives that have come out of this. And I think absolutely an agility that we've seen in, in our health service that we maybe haven't seen in the past. And um, I think that is a positive and, and, and great to know that the trials are really contributing to, to better outcomes for people in, in Ireland and worldwide. 
Um, and in terms of those positives, I think maybe, Anne, uh, would you like to come in here in terms of the, the fact that we're actually um, at a point now where vaccine and vaccination programmes are being rolled out only a year um, into a new disease? Yeah, so I think that is uh, one really positive thing. I mean, if we think the development of a vaccine, it happened very quickly based on a huge amount of prior uh, research. Um, but even, you know, even in September, October, we didn't actually know if the vaccines that were being developed would actually protect people against this disease. And that's another really positive recent finding that these vaccines do work. Um, and, uh, you know, we're not in a, in a dark period of years of looking for a vaccine as we have been in for other infectious diseases, HIV being the, the, the one that springs to mind. Um, and I think it is, we have vaccines, we have more vaccines with multiple candidates coming through, hopefully. Um, they're safe, they're very high quality, um, and uh, we know they work. And it is a question now of getting those vaccines into people. And, and for years, our research has been very much on making it easier to, to administer vaccines to people, uh, getting away from needles and syringes. We're not quite ready uh, yet. If it was an oral polio or an oral vaccine, it would be you know, similar to oral polio vaccine. Uh, so we've missed this, uh, you know, they're not ready for this pandemic, but um, there are vaccines going into people's arms uh, quite quickly. And even in this country, I think one of the things that we're facing now, so we have a vaccine. The next thing is, will people accept the vaccine? There's very high uptake, very high interest in having those vaccines uh, administered. And I think it is now people are, as often happens when a new vaccine is available, people are screaming for it and wanting it now. And I think it is a question of it is coming. There is a very good plan in Ireland to immunise people and uh, to, to just stick with that plan. It seems to be working. There doesn't seem to be an issue with vaccine uh, availability and it's coming. It will get there. We will all be immunised. And I think Anna, Mar Anna Maria has very, very good experience of both mixing. Like for, for me, I'm a scientist. I can think about developing vaccines and the immunology behind it. But the other part of it really is community acceptance and kind of the, the social science of it and the other side of it as well that is as fundamental as having that vaccine that's available. Thanks, thanks, Anna. I agree, it's really important and um, that we think about vaccine confidence and you know we're, we're at a very positive point in Ireland and we know that there is much more vaccine hesitancy in other places. And um, I don't know, Anna Maria, if you'd like to come in there on the kind of international perspective on how we um, ensure that there is confidence in the vaccines and how we think about rolling out programmes. Let me just begin and then a real follow up because I, just to give you just maybe the landscape and everything that's been said has been true and we agree with all of the points. But uh, it's 36 days since the first countries started vaccinating, 37 days today, I think. Uh, it's, uh, it's 17 days since the EU countries started vaccinating. About 28.2 million vaccines uh, have been administered uh, on a global basis. We're using five different vaccine products. 46 countries have started vaccinating. Only one of those countries is a low-income country. The world map today looks horrific. Uh, but uh, we're trying through the COVAX initiative to, uh, to change that. But we also need, uh, need our countries to continue the commitment. The COVAX facility is the best solution we have globally. Um, but we need companies who haven't submitted their dossiers for emergency use listing to do that. It's not acceptable to be making backdoor deals and selling vaccine and distributing it globally and not uh, giving us the data we need to get the emergency listings, which will allow us to trigger our contracts through the COVAX initiative. You can't have your cake and eat it in this regard. Uh, we need uh, countries to provide financial support to COVAX. And right now we're asking countries, particularly in the European Union and others, to share small amounts of their, uh, of their Pfizer vaccine to at least initiate vaccine of frontline health workers in low income countries. Um, uh, we, are, uh, we do see, and it is every country's sovereign right to protect its citizens uh, and to particularly to protect health workers and those most vulnerable. But we cannot end up in the ethical situation in a few weeks' time where we will potentially be moving in Europe and other places to vaccinating perfectly healthy young people um, and then not having vaccinated the frontline health workers and the older, more vulnerable people in other countries. So we are coming to a point, I fully agree, we're accelerating quickly, but we're accelerating unevenly. And we're in danger of creating one of the greatest injustices that this planet has seen. We're not there yet, but we need to really 
uh, take a look in the rear view mirror and see who's dragging behind uh, because uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's not, it's not, uh, it doesn't look good. I think we can fix it if we recommit to the principles of COVAX. COVAX works, but we need, COVAX can only work if everyone does their job, if everyone does what they committed to do. Uh, and I think we can move from having a, uh, a difficult situation to having a global solution uh, that works. We are thrilled to see the development of vaccines. And Maria will 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 just outline for you where we are in vaccine development because there's a lot more coming through the pipeline and there's a lot more research going on and there's a lot we need to do in terms of monitoring the rollout of the current vaccines. And uh, Anna Maria will be hosting a big meeting here in Geneva tomorrow uh, on the vaccine roadmap and the next steps in monitoring and rollout of vaccines. So Anna Maria. Yes, I just want to uh, add to Mike uh, that besides the work we are doing in COVAX, WHO is working in two other areas. One is to, in accelerating the evaluation of more vaccines, because it is clear we need more doses and more vaccines available. Maybe vaccines with better attributes, as it was noted. Vaccines that require one dose, vaccines that have easier cold chain, vaccines that can be administered without needles and syringes. So we are very, very happy with having some initial candidate vaccines coming through, but we are very convinced that the, the, the work is not done. This is why on Friday, tomorrow, we're going to have a discussion. There are 2,700 scientists from all around the world, lead, led a conversation led by 40 of the lead vaccine scientists to discuss exactly that. How do we learn more about the vaccines who are now being rolled out? Because there are still remaining scientific questions on these vaccines. How do we learn more about the vaccines that are in the pipeline? We have, we are very lucky because there are about 37 uh, uh, vaccines that are moving into the clinical phase. There are about 130 clinical trials registered for COVID vaccines. So there is a lot of progress, but that's good, but not good enough as Mike says. And then we need to think about the 170 candidate vaccines that are in the, the clinical phase. Maybe one of them could be the solution. Maybe they all can contribute in a small or big way. So we have a big research agenda that needs to be accomplished that we need to move forward. This research agenda also includes our understanding of what is the optimal way, the alternative ways we can use the vaccines we have available. And Mike was talking about the fairness issue, the access issue, but also the intelligentsia issue or how if I have a limited number of doses globally, I use these doses in the most intelligent way. So as Dr. Tedros says, we are all safe at the end of it. Because imagine you vaccinate all the population in your country, but the vaccine you use have only a duration of protection of 12 months and the disease continues to transmit widely in other parts of the world. It means after 12 months, you are back to square one. So this is why solidarity is not only a sentimental issue, but an epidemiological and a public health reality that needs to be addressed. In addition to that, we have been working and WHO has been working with the countries to prepare for the deployment of vaccines. You have probably seen that tools have been developed and the countries, as Dr. Tedo says, are now ready. They have improved their capacity, they up their game, but we need to give them the opportunity and the access to these life-saving vaccines. And one thing that is, has come out on this and we have discussed is that unfortunately or fortunately for developing countries, they have more a tradition and an experience in conducting mass campaigns. They have done it for eradication of many diseases, smallpox, polio, measles, uh, recently in Ebola in very difficult locations. So we, uh, it's our hope that when the vaccines start being rolling out in the developing countries, the speed of the vaccination, the quality of the rollouts will be better, will be best, and that we can move forward. And then finally, I just want to um, emphasize the issue of the collaboration. Despite all these challenges we are highlighting to you today, this experience from the scientific point of view has been an excellent ex a, a spirit of collaboration. We haven't seen these levels of sharing and willingness to contribute by different scientists worldwide. And this is in the context of polarized situations of nationalism and challenges. So we need to recognize that part of the game. And we need to thank the thousands of scientists that have been working with us for over a year now, meeting every week 
contributing, sharing their data, etc. So we are not in the perfect world, but there are some bright spots that we need to underscore. Yeah, and we've been working just to complete that. Uh, we've just through the first phase and completed uh, what's called a 100 by 100 initiative. We spent the last 100 days working with 100 countries, with UNICEF, the World Bank and ourselves in a systematic process for preparing the countries uh, with the least capacity to be able to absorb, uh, import, regulate, distribute and deliver vaccines to population. So we're ready. Uh, COVAX is ready. We just need to inject the vaccines and the funding into that. And I think that's going to be a big issue at our executive board next week uh, to, to really put this on the table. We need to move forward together and solve this problem together. Back to you. Great. Thanks. And um, absolutely uh, agree with the importance of um, having equitable access. And I wonder whether the emergence of the new variants and um, you know, we, we've talked about the fact that we live in a, in a global society and um, whether there may, the risk that's posed by these new variants might in some ways, um, you know, you would hope that countries will act the right way um, in the interests anyway, but um, there's now an additional reason in terms of uh, protecting um, themselves that they might take a, a different approach. And I'm just wondering whether that's something that you've considered. Um. Yes, I mean, the, the, the jury's still out and there's a lot of work still ongoing to establish whether or not uh, any of the emerging variants uh, have any negative impact on vaccination. We don't have any hard evidence of, as yet, mm -hmm. uh, but we have to be very careful. The current selective pressure on the virus is a fitness pressure, which is really about its transmissibility, its infectiousness and its ability to reproduce. And therefore it drives uh, infectiousness, transmission, viral load, uh, maybe duration of infectiousness, and that has a big implication for transmission. What we haven't seen yet are severity signals, and what we haven't seen yet are escape phenomenon yet with the monoclonals, the polyclonals, or the vaccines. But as a, uh, and but there are random pressures there. There isn't particular selective pressure for that to happen, mm -hmm. but there are random changes that could occur. We've seen that. I mean, the D614G mutation or vari variant that emerged in February and March had almost, between February and May, completely replaced the global circulating strain. So we are, I mean, you know, when we talk about the wild type, the type of virus that was transmitting before these new variants emerged was a completely different virus to the one that started in January. Yes. It didn't end the world. The same measures worked. Uh, uh, but, you know, we have to be very, very careful because this virus is now got a very big, big pitch to play on. Mm. Uh, and it's infecting literally millions of people at one time. So therefore, the chances, just looking at this uh, from a, a lottery perspective, uh, we, have a, we need to reduce the number of people being infected. We need to, to get to a point where variations will emerge, they'll continue to emerge. We've had the D614, we've had the Cluster 5 uh, variant in Denmark amongst the mink. We've had the variant of concern in, in, the, in the UK. We've had the 501YV2 in South Africa. And uh, now we have a B11 two, four, eight in uh, mm -hmm. travelers from Brazil to, to Japan and some indications that there are problems in, in certain areas in, in Brazil with the same issue. So we've seen that occur over time. Uh, we need to monitor it very closely yes. and we need a global monitoring framework. And might I add uh, just a shout out to the National Virus Research Unit in, in, in Dublin. Uh, they've been absolutely outstanding. They've, they've really led the way. And I think over the last few weeks have really demonstrated how they've been able to do systematic sequencing to look at the issue in Ireland. Every country needs that. We're trying to expand that now in other countries. Mm -hmm. And we'll be looking to Ireland and Irish scientists to help us maybe do that in distributing more of the the uh, the sequencing capacities, but also the analytics and the software that goes with that sequencing machines that allows the analytics to be done locally as well. So it would be great to be able to partner up with, uh, with, with uh, the people there. We need to have monitoring framework for the uh, maybe Anna Maria could just speak very briefly because I think it's very important for people to understand that we have this we're we're watching the virus and we're monitoring its potential impact on vaccines and there's a tremendous amount of work going on right now in, both in terms of the laboratory assays in terms of uh, the animal mm -hmm. studies and in terms of real world studies to look for any signals that the vaccine may lose uh, uh, effectiveness. I don't know, Anna Maria, just a minute yes, on that. Yes, I just want to add that um, as discussed on, uh, on Tuesday, uh, we have activated all our expert groups since uh, December, and we have discussions on the animal models, 
the series of studies that will be um, helpful to understand if there are changes in the pathogenicity, if there are changes in the transmission, and also if there are effects on the way we are treating patients with the different uh, treatments and vaccines. So these studies are ongoing and, and, and are being planned. And a lot of the discussion is about sharing the virus, the serum very quickly. So the studies can start in parallel across the planet, that's critical. In terms of the um, uh, vaccines in the field, we also are uh, discussing three things. First is that the breakthrough cases are going to become the more important cases we have to investigate mm -hmm. in the future, because they will tell us not only about the effect of the vaccines, uh, but also will help us understand the effect of the variants on the efficacy of the vaccines. So we are now going to start seriously promoting that countries that when they have breakthrough cases, they hopefully investigate them according to an agreed international protocol that we collect an agreed series of samples and that we test them and share the information live. And the third point is the communication. Since this is an evolving situation, we think we should maintain our forums of discussion in these expert groups, but also create a wider forum for conversation on what countries are experiencing, the data they are accumulating and how that could be interpreted in the regional and the global perspective. Because if we don't do that, if we wait until we have the publication in the peer review journal of the new variant or the new strain, it could be maybe way too late for us to react. And finally, we are also discussing how we can use this new emerging variants characterization and genomic sequencing to alert the developers. And maybe to start discussing our way to react like we do for flu vaccines, to create new vaccines, develop them, discuss how we are going to accelerate the evaluation of the new ones. Maybe we don't need to start all the studies, but do some comparison uh, trials uh, in between. So all this is, a, is very important. And I think uh, we, we, we will continue to have, as you know, uh, new variants emerging. But what is important is that we have this approach that we all work together that we all share the data, not for the sake of looking good, but for the sake of having the hard conversations or what does it mean in terms of scientific implications. Great, thanks, Anne-Marie. And I agree absolutely that it's so important that we work together in, in terms of our reaction to the new variants. And I suppose one of the things that I've been struck by is individual countries, you know, stopping travelers from a particular country and whether there's a really need for us um, to think differently about this and uh, particularly around travel and how we um, can work together to have a more strategic approach. I don't know uh, if, if Mike or, or Anne-Marie would like to. One of the reasons I was late, I was passing by the Director General's office, we were just discussing this. Our emergency committee is in session right now, actually looking at the variance issue specifically. Uh, and providing temporary recommendations to 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 to, to Tedros uh, on that, uh, you know, clearly we have to be very careful in terms of travel restrictions within or between countries is a big is a big deal because it it, it can effectively shut down social and economic life. Uh, but at the same time, we have to be able to use measures uh, judiciously. If you look at uh, in um, in Denmark when they had the mink strain, they sh they didn't do a national shut; they shut down a, a region, an area until they had containment and they got that containment. It really depends. Uh, that virus was not maybe that fit in humans because it came back from an animal source. So therefore there were, it was a relatively easy, uh, easy is, is to undermine what Denmark achieved, but they were able to contain the situation. Uh, with a highly infectious variant that's already, you know, got into 30 or 40 countries, the idea of being able to contain that further maybe uh, too late. What we really need to do is be able to understand the nature of each variant and what signals it's giving us. We see a signal of increased severity or vaccine escape, mm -hmm. and we have small clusters, and therefore that really going to depend on how good our genetic surveillance is. And therefore, rather than just random genetic sequencing of, of samples, we'd like to see targeted genetic sequencing. You look for the epi signal, you look for a signal of clinical severity. If you find that you're seeing an unusual cluster of deaths, unusual clustering of cases, get in there, do more testing, do more sequencing. Let's get the information early rather than trying to pick up a random variant and then seeing, well, what are the implications of that variant? 
It's how long is a piece of string? You know, you've got a variant, but you don't know its implications until you see it operate in the real world. So we need to look for real world changes and signals of concern. And we need to be really aggressive then in oversampling, over testing and over sequencing in certain areas to give ourselves an early warning of a shift or a change. And then I think in that situation, Tricia, you have an opportunity to use travel measures for containment. Uh, and I think it's a really, there are situations in which restricting travel in or out of a given area may have an impact in that situation. You have to know the geographic extent of that. Uh, you have to know how much you can seal an area off. Uh, and even if you do that, travel measures don't are not 100% effective. So even if you were to do that kind of thing, you would still have to have supplementary surveillance and measures outside the area. So travel measures, like everything else, I keep saying it, there are no silver bullets in, 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 in this. We're chasing unicorns, you know. On the one hand, you know, everyone says, well, you know, we're going to have a solution and vaccines are going to be the total solution. No. Or the, the total solution is masks. No. The total so what we have is we're adding new tools to the toolkit every day. The question is how we use them, when we use them, where we use them. Uh, and are we able to, in some sense, conduct that orchestra uh, of the different things we're doing? And can that be conducted in a way at a national and international level, it's maximally efficient and effective, it's, uh, it's able to absorb and use resources efficiently and deliver. Uh, and I think that's where we need to look at sequencing now. We need a rapid expansion and we've been doing it and it's been going on. It's been, as Marie, Anna Maria said, there's been a huge sharing of sequences. Um, I think we're probably 50, 100 fold sharing going on in terms of sequences over the last year than previously. Um, but we need to support those institutions that are doing that and the ones who are, are uh, stewarding that. There's a lot of those platforms are under pressure. They were never designed to do what they're doing. There's not necessarily the analytic tools associated with that that everyone can use. So there's an awful lot of capacitation that needs to go on to put in place a global surveillance system. It was hard enough for cases and lab data. Now we've got to add in systematic genetic sequencing on top of that across the whole world. It's going to be a challenge. I think we can do it. And I think then we should look at travel as one of the tools or travel restrictions as one of the tools we have in the toolkit and, and, and where it can be used. Like, for example, I'll give you the, in Denmark, where they restricted travel in and out of an area of concern where they had a variant of concern until they fully understood the situation. They were able to contain that variant within a geographic zone. And it's to their credit and the other countries who assisted in that. Thank you. Um, and in terms of the, the toolkit, um, I suppose vaccines, you know, obviously are, are a critical part of that. And one of the questions that's um, come in is the risk that people may become complacent after vaccination. Um, and I wonder, maybe I'll bring um, Dr. Moore in there because I know she's done a lot of work around uh, vaccine confidence and uptake in, in the population. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess we can see at the moment, everybody was waiting for the, the light at the end of the tunnel. And for a lot of people, that was a vaccine. And um, it, as Mike said, it's it, it's part of the the, the tool uh, the tools that we have in the in the box. Um, but it's it's um, we the vaccines that are licensed at the moment for use um, have been designed to protect against disease, and we don't know at this stage if they protect against transmission. They may, they may not. It's immunologically they they may not, and we need more vaccines that could actually work uh, to deliberately prevent transmission. Um, so uh, we're not going to be able to, you know, suddenly open up when, you know, 78 percent of the country are are uh, on are immunized. So it is a question of, you know, it, it is one tool in the kit. And it's great from a, even an individual level that you have significantly reduced your chance of, of being infected with uh, and having disease from COVID. But you, you could still pro you could still spread it and you could still transmit it. So it is just one tool. Hopefully, with all the tools together, we can get rid of this. But it, it's at the moment until we have vaccines that deliberately prevent transmission, uh, you you may still be uh, a cause of, of of spreading it on to somebody else. But you you significantly reduced your chance of getting disease. Great, thanks, Anne. And as you mentioned, um, the vaccines do reduce disease transmission. So hopefully, the kind of pressures that we're seeing in our intensive care units and hospitals at the moment. Um, you know, hopefully that will, will reduce over time. But one of the questions that's come in, um, Alistair, that you might like to take up um, is around the development of the most effective 
medicine for COVID-19? And indeed, is it a medicine or is it the way that you're managing the cases? Oh, well, I, I think maybe to pick up the other thing, it, it, it's going to be a combination. Um, uh, we have um, a greater understanding of this disease now than we, we did at the start. And from an intensive care point of view, when a patient with respiratory failure presents to the ICU, we, we actually we, we have a greater understanding of uh, treatments that may or may not be effective and also uh, treatments that may or may not pose a risk for aerosol generating procedures for staff. So we actually have a greater handle of that and a greater handle of what we need to do to protect staff in place. Um, it, it, it's, it's, it's going to be a battle of inches. Um, it, the number of things that we do to help someone survive a stay in ICU and reduce their mortality and morbidity. It's a combination of things. Some of it is in uh, treatments we give. Uh, some of it is in the care we can provide. And also it's really vital that the healthcare system is not stressed because the more stressed the healthcare system is, the more the normal care actually can get eroded. And then, but finally is actually discovering new treatments. And um, I, I saw one of the, in the chat, somebody asked, are the new variants affecting uh, some of the new treatments we've found? And so I suppose the answer is, I have spent many years doing clinical trials and they commonly take, I mean, years and years to answer one question. And we have actually worked at an amazing speed collaborating with other countries and other researchers to answer some of these questions in months. So the answer is, we are, we are finding new treatments. There are many more we're testing. And I think you'll find that the ideal regimen for a patient will be a combination of different things, both care and pharmaceutical agents given. And at the moment, it is, it's too early to tell if the impact of new, what impact the new variants may have on outcomes. But um, it was interesting just listening to Mike talking about surveillance. So we had always felt that the ICU was sort of the canary in the coal mine that either for um, a new pandemic starting or maybe a new variant that uh, patients presenting who are different, maybe younger, no comorbidities or patients who are much more se severely affected. So we're in Ireland, we're actually taking part in an observational study called Sprintsari, which is actually 18 hospitals all collecting the same data. But one of the real advantages is uh, we're working internationally and actually it's been endorsed by the WHO and led out of Oxford is we're collecting the same information in say Cork or Dublin as in Paris or London. So we can directly compare our patients and their outcomes and experiences internationally. So we would hopefully be able to see if a new cluster was presenting with a different phenotype and people were getting much sicker. So in, in summary, we're getting there. The treatment has improved over the last nine months, but we, we, we still have more to go. There's still unfortunately a, uh, scarily high mortality of patients in ICA with COVID-19. Thanks, Alistair. Um, I think as we come to the kind of end of this uh, conversation, which has been about the, the New Year's challenges, one of the questions that's come in has asked us to sort of um, skip forward a few years. Um, and um, I think this is for, for Mike and Anna-Maria, maybe to think about if we were here in 2025, how the WHO um, would see the way that global leaders and in international politics and governments um, uh, would handle uh, a more pathogenic viral pandemic um, you know, with a, a mortality rate of 10 to 20%. And I suppose maybe what the lessons we are learning from, from how we're dealing with the current pandemic. Oh, have you got another hour or two? <laughs> um, um, no, that is the, whatever they call it, the $60 million question. I mean, we're in a world of pain right now and I, I would hate to, project too far the forward because it, it, in a sense because it may disrespect the suffering of those who are losing their lives now and we have to focus on that on those we're losing and stop that and again a shout out to our colleagues on the clinical side they've been amazing and that work they're doing in, in is not just on the, the the trials but on gathering that standardized data all over the world uh, on managing clinical pathways in a way that we give each patient the best chance in the system. It's not just about the therapeutics. It's about who gets them when and how you triage and how you move it. It's everything from the triage nurse at the front door of the hospital right the way through to how the phys physiotherapists and others uh, engage with the patient. It's teamwork and it's teamwork in units, between units and between institutions and across the world. And I think we've seen our cl clinical colleagues have led the way in a selfless 
selflessness for their own safety, but also selflessness for their own data or publications and have, have really shown the way uh, for the future in terms of collaboration. So Alistair, congrats to you on behalf of all of the frontline workers who've been just such heroes in this. The sad thing in surveillance, in my experience in emerging diseases, do you know what the single most um, uh, the single most predictive factor in detecting a new emerging disease in a developing country, in my experience, has always been, very often, the death of a clinician or a nurse. The canaries in the coal mine. <laughs> Literally. Yeah. And, you know, and uh, to me, you know, we, we really do need to be aware of severe disease as it shows up. Smart clinicians know something's wrong. They see a pattern in a patient or between patients, and they notice. When they signal something, we need to take it seriously. It's not all about labs and surveillance. We need to be much more aware of the outlier uh, and what that represents and rely on the clinic. And we need to build that into our surveillance systems. Human intuition and human experience is being undervalued as we, you know, we, we explore the fifth and sixth and 10th industrial or, uh, revolution and, and IT. And that's now, I'm an IT file. I want us to develop all of that, but we cannot forget that a human observation is still at the center of us finding out problems and developing solutions. Uh, and if we're going to move forward, I, I think we have to have that at the center. Um, the reality is that this is a, a un, it's, it's catastrophic to even say these words. This is a mild pandemic in the sense of the number of people infected who die. Um, uh, and uh, we need to learn the lessons. Uh, I have to say, after 25 years or more doing this, sometimes I become cynical because I've been in the front line in cholera and in Ebola and in relapsing fever and in Lassa and, and, and in SARS and in H1N1 and H5N1. And I've heard all of this rhetoric before. To me, there's a massive gap between the rhetoric and the reality of what we, as a public health, as a healthcare community, have, are expected to do with the resources that we have. Because you know what? The amnesia will set in and the system will forget. And in five years time, Alistair will be standing in his unit wondering where the hell did all the resources go? Or the, the labs will be doing the same or the public health will be doing the same. We will be on learning lessons. Uh, I'm, I'm actually, I'm quite sick of that word. We need to implement solutions. And we need to start doing it now. We know what they are. I can write all these. There's no more reviews going on now than there are variant and mutant viruses, right? We've got mutation in reviews, right? Uh, and everyone's going to have an opinion. And that's great. But we need to do something about those opinions and those findings. And we need to invest sustainably. And we need to recognize, as I've said before, we're on a fragile planet that has existential problems in social justice, in climate, in uh, stability, and in the stability of our biome. Our biome, the biologic uh, covering that this earth have is unstable, it is fragile. And we as a global community, we as a civilization are, we've become the parasites. You know, we're destabilizing the very uh, ecosystem that has supported us for hundreds of thousands of years. In that sense, we are the pollution. We're affecting the stability of that system. And that system is getting its payback because not only are we driving the risks up because of the way we live and the way we exploit environments and, and that, we're driving the risks. But even if you said, well, to hell with it, we have to live. We're not even managing the, the, the consequent risk that comes with creating the biologic risk. We're not even mitigating those risks by putting in place the systems to deal with the problems when they occur. Um, so we need to do two things. We need to stabilize the biome. We need to reduce the pressure, the evolutionary pressure on viruses at the animal-human environment interface. And we need the systems in place when those viruses do break through to be able to deal with them effectively. Now, that means we need to invest and not see this as a cost. This is not a cost. This is an investment in the future of our civilization, the future of our planet. I frankly, at times, I wonder, I, I, I become ashamed when I think of the planet we're handing over to our kids in terms of civil rights and justice, in terms of the number of people around the world as refugees, the, the, the way migrants and other people are treated, the way social injustice has grown, intolerance has grown, 
And yet at the same time, as Anna Maria said, I'm filled with hope for what scientists and communities have done in the face of this pandemic. So I must say I'm, I'm torn in two, in a sense, with a deep cynicism and sadness for what we've experienced and what we're going through and a profound hope that, you know what, maybe with this and with climate, we can turn this around and we can make this better. And I have to say, as my staff regard me as, I used to think I was an incurable optimist. Uh, Tom Grine, my incident manager here, has changed that to a pathological optimist. So I've now, I've now moved from being a, uh, an incurable to a pathological. Uh, but you have to be that in the work we do. Uh, we witness a lot of suffering around the world. We see a lot of bad things. We have to believe that we as a human race are better. Scientists uh, and health workers and, and social workers and psychologists and others who work with communities have demonstrated what can be achieved when we pull together. Um, we can find the solutions. The technical part is easy. It's getting our governments to recognize that we need not one year or two years. We need two decades of sustained investment in a global and national infrastructure to deal with this problem. And we need to stop, frankly, underinvesting in our core health systems. We cannot continue to run our health systems on 110% occupancy. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, we, we, we have no elasticity. There's no surge capacity left. You know, the only surge capacity we have left is that Alistair and his team get to work double hours or triple hours. That's the surge. We are relying on the goodwill and the humanitarianism of so many people to keep the basic system going, even without a pandemic. It's not sustainable. Uh, and, and, and I think it is time for the adults in the world to have a conversation, or maybe we should hand it over to the kids because we're not doing such a great job. Uh, thanks, Mike. Um, I think, I mean, I, I'm struggling here to come up with words to, to follow those. And I don't know if you've been following the chat, but, you know, people are just um, incredibly Thankful by the words that, that you've shared with us and all the panel, you know, I think we've, we've, we, we understand the, the suffering that's going on and we've heard from the cold face, but um, I agree that it is really important that we have hope, um, but that we're realistic in our hope and that we actually do speak to the types of changes that need to be made and be realistic about the type of timelines that are involved. So um, I just want to thank again um, our panelists for the, for the time and for sharing your, your wisdom with us today. Thank you. And to the RIA. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Stay safe.